is undeserved. Another aspect of this love is that it is unearthly. It is unearthly. There is absolutely no love on the face of the earth that is like the love of Almighty God that he demonstrated when he sent his son, Jesus Christ. It is a heavenly love. And the Bible talks about it as describing it as an agape love. It is a God-like love. It is an unearthly love because it is heaven sent from heaven for us, right? Another aspect of the affection of the Father that we see in this third chapter of 1 John is the fact that there is, like it's been slighted, the, the, the sliding of the world. In 1 John 3, 1, the people who belong to this world don't know God. So, so they don't understand that we are his children. You know, sometimes when unbelievers observe believers, non-Christians watch uh, Christians, they, 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 I think, stand back and they just try to think, to figure them out. Is this real, what you're doing, this love that you're demonstrating? And yet, in reality, it is because we know that we've been changed from darkness to light, and this love has captivated us. As Paul said, I'm saying to you today, I am a love slave of Jesus Christ. And this is, I believe, the objective that Christ wants all of us to experience in our lives. Hallelujah. Amen. Can I tell you, this home is, uh, this world is not our home. Don't get too comfortable in this world. This world is simply a place that we're passing through. It's temporary. The reality is, is this world is, is a place that we're just passing through. And we have to understand that the temporariness of this world in which we live. Don't let yourself become too comfortable here. Because you are going to just be passing through. One of the great things about passing through here is that, is that the Lord has told us in these verses that we have a potential. That he sees a potential in us. One day, I don't know when it will be. Well, I do know it will be when we see him. That's what we've read this morning in these verses. That... The potential that God sees in us in verse 2 is that eventually we are going to be like Him. We are striving to be like Him, but and He is working in us to make us more like Him. God is perfecting this work of grace in each and every one of us to make us more like Him. We have so much potential. We have the potential to be like Jesus. And He is working in us to make this possible because He sent Him uh, His Holy Spirit to live in us. And that Holy Spirit who lives within us is working within us, conforming us, and, and, and drawing us to the place of discipline and commitment and understanding obedience that we would become more like Him. Do you know the church is not perfect? The church is not perfect, but God is at work and He's ironing out the wrinkles. Amen. He's getting the wrinkles out. God is cleaning up all the spots and the church is headed for perfection. Amen. Not because of who the church is, but because of whose the church is. Amen. We are the bride of Christ and a beautiful bride we are. Can I hear an amen? amen. He moves on in these, in these verses to help us understand as John is teaching us today. Uh, of his own experience. He talks about our practice. He refers to our practice in verse 3. Our position and our potential should determine our practice. Why should we learn about it and have more of an understanding of eschatology? The word eschatology simply means the study of end times. Why should we be educating ourselves in this area of studying end times? Why should we be familiarizing ourselves with what God says in His Word He has promised He is going to do and what it will all turn out like? Why should we be doing that? I believe so that we can put into practice these truths today so that we can truly be ready for Him when He returns. If this is a process of getting ready. It's a process of preparation so that we can begin to practice even now what we're going to be enjoying when we are with Him eternally and for all of eternity spending it with Him. Amen? Amen. So when, if we know Jesus is coming again, if we know that, the Bible says in verse 3 of 1 John 3, He says that if we know He's coming again, and He is, it means then this should alter our behavior. And because I know he's coming again, and realize this, every man, in verse 3, it says, that has that hope or knowledge that he is coming again, even so purifies himself. This is an act of our own will and our own choice, right? Sandy was uh, doing some study with me on this. 
And she was sharing with me some things. I think I can say her favorite Old Testament character is Moses. In Exodus 19, God says to Moses, listen, I want to have a meeting with the people down there. My people. And I want you to give them some instructions to prepare for when I come down to meet them. And so God gave Moses some specific instructions in chapter 19 of Exodus that he was to take down to the bottom of the mountain to tell the children of Israel who were there waiting. So Moses came down from having a conversation with God. And here's what he began to talk to the people about and what God was expecting them to do. God told Moses in Exodus 19 and verse 10, tell the people they must sanctify themselves. Now we're talking about purity here. Tell the people that they must sanctify themselves. And even Moses was given the responsibility of sanctifying them. And they were called to follow these strict guidelines, specifically if they were to be holy before God and be pure. Alright? He says, let them be ready. Exodus 19 and verse 11. And so he began to tell them what God, Moses began to tell them what God told him. That they were to wash their clothes. Now, what does washing your clothes have to do with sanctifying yourself? What is any, any association with this washing of your clothes? How many of you wash your clothes, and when you wash your clothes, you don't think of God? <laughs> do you? If you do, you're a much far more spiritual person than I am. <laughs> right? When, when, when the clothes are getting washed, we just want to get the dirt out. We yes. want them to be fresh. Yeah. But what Moses was trying to apply to the people here and what God was helping him understand was when the people are washing their clothes, it was during the time of washing their clothes that they were to be contemplating and thinking about the sin in their heart and in their life. And they were to be repenting of their sin while they were washing their clothes. You know, there's always an exterior compared to the interior or associated with it. Moses goes down to the bottom of the mountain with the instructions that God gave him, have the people wash their clothes, that there is this understanding and idea that when we come before God, we come before him, the King of kings and Lord of lords, we come before him with our very best. Our very best. And we do it beforehand. Mind you, I didn't tell you earlier, God told Moses, listen, I want to meet with my people, and I'm going to give them two days to get it, to get it together. I'm going to give them 48 hours. So that they can do the things I'm describing for them. And then on the third day, that's when the meeting's going to take place. And they better be sure that it's all done before then. The inference here is, is that we must prepare ourselves before coming into the presence of God. The inference here, when Moses told the people, wash your clothes. He was basically saying, take this time while you're washing your clothes to deal with any wandering thoughts. To bring them in. Any impure affections that you might abandon them. Any disturbing passions must be suppressed or subdued. Any and all cares of secular business or responsibilities with work or your job, dismissed. So one reason, so our hearts can be engaged to approach God. Listen, you can't approach God with any of these things truly on your heart and be close to God. You can't be in prayer and intimate and in the presence of the King of Kings and be thinking, I've got to get that report done for my office. It's got to be taken care of. We can't do, those are distractions. I wouldn't say they're sins so much, but they are distractions. So that was one of the reasons that God gave Moses this instruction to tell the people, but you'll find something else in Exodus 19 that was totally amazing. In Exodus 19 and verse 15, he also went on to tell them, uh, Moses told the people, when you begin to prepare your hearts to come into the presence of the king, to be in the presence of God, you must abstain from all lawful enjoyments and not come to your wife. Whoa. Do you know, I'm going to get out on an edge here just talking about this. Do you know an intimate relationship, a sexual relationship, is not a sinful thing. It's a God thing. Because God created this between husband 